And this webinar is being hosted by our iSchool Diversity Committee, but also in conjunction with our uh, College of Professional and Global Education Academic EDI Committee. And we wanna welcome you here today for a webinar on humble leadership as a humble practice. Uh, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel uh, after the session, usually within a week or two. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Zan Goodman. Zan Goodman is a health sciences librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where she supports three schools in her work in the Division of Health Sciences, the School of Integrated Health Sciences, School of Public Health, and School of Nursing. Uh, she'll be speaking with us today about the concept of humble leadership and its application in librarianship. And I do have to say, I studied Shine. I have my yeah. book with all my notes uh, <laughs> in my... Yeah, in my doctoral work. So I was really excited to see this topic and I'm interested in learning from you as I'm sure our attendees are around how we can apply this uh, within our profession. So I'm gonna turn it back, back over to you, Zan. Okay, hi everyone, good morning. I would like to thank Dr. Villagran for uh, in this invitation to talk with y'all today about uh, humble leadership as a humble practice. So I wanna invite y'all to go along with me on this journey during this webinar as I share with you my ideas about what I've been thinking and reading about related to humble leadership as a humble practice. But before I begin, I want to... I want to offer a land acknowledgement for where I am located. I wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities of this region. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, what is called Las Vegas, Nevada now. I want to recognize that the university that I'm at is situated on the traditional homelands of the new movie Southern Paiute people. I offer gratitude for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, for the opportunity to study, learn, work, and be in community with this land. My university encourages everyone in this space to engage and continue learning about indigenous peoples who work and live on this land since time immemorial, including the Las Vegas Paiute tribe and the Moapa Band of Paiutes and also to learn about the historical and present realities of colonialism. As one of the most diverse universities in the United States, UNLV believes it's important to recognize and appreciate the use of Southern Paiute land as part of its mission to be a welcoming and inclusive place for working and learning. Thank you for listening. And you may watch a version of this land acknowledgement I have on my slide here, but I'll also put it in the chat for you later so you can watch a version of this. So here's the outline of my talk today. I'm going to talk to y'all, give you an overview about the history and origins of humble leadership. I'm going to talk about key characteristics of this concept. I'm going to share the value and significance and connect it to um, a framework that I've developed uh, looking at humble leadership as a humble practice. And I'm gonna talk about some limitations and criticisms of this uh, concept. But I first want to begin by sharing with you a definition of leadership. And I want to also say that my background really informs how I think about topics of diversity and inclusion. I'm a born and raised Detroiter who grew up in the city, not the suburbs. And that particular experience undergirds my thinking and approach to topics of diversity and inclusion. I want to begin here with this definition by Nordhaus, the seminal textbook by Peter Nordhaus on leadership. He defines leadership as a process whereby an individual influences a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. I want to give you an opportunity to share with us how you might view leadership. So I have this Minty poll here. You could go to minty.com and use the code. I think Dr. Villagrin will put that in the chat for you. It's 20148218. And I'm going to give folks time to populate that poll. I'm going to stop share and I'm going to pull up the Minty. Okay. 
share my screen. And hopefully, okay. Okay, so I see some comments coming in. Someone who listens. Active listening is a humble practice. Motivating and enabling others, guiding your team. Inspiring and guiding, inspire, lots of inspiration team builder, okay, lots of good comments, communication, listening. So there's there's lots, people are contributing a lot here. Thank you for sharing all of these thoughts. I'm gonna come back to a few of these as humble practices as we go on. So I'm gonna stop share once more. I'm gonna share my slides for you again here. So. Okay, so when we think about humble leadership, humble leadership is an emergent topic, and this is a definition that I've come up with for humble leadership. I see humble leadership as an emergent approach to organizational leadership that's influenced by philosophical and historical context of varied religious traditions that view humility as a virtue. Humble leadership aims to distinguish humility as a dispositional trait of humble persons that is maximized in organizational settings to be relationally oriented, thereby contributing to trust and openness. So in this definition of humility, uh, it describes uh, humility as a dispositional trait. And I want to define for you what I mean by trait. So Nordhaus describes trait as being applicable to a leader as in a leader has has these certain traits, for example, extroversion or height. Oxford Dictionary describes trait as considered to be something that is part of an individual's personality and therefore a long-term characteristic of an individual that shows through their behavior, action, or and feelings. Some view humility as a concept with both state and trait-like characteristics, and state refers to a condition. So this could be a temporary condition that a person is experiencing for a short period of time. After the state passes, they return to another condition. So all people have temporary states, for example, being calm in a certain situation or being angry in certain situations. Those are the actual states. But there is some debate about both of these terms. Uh, sometimes there's some confusion even about the use of state and trait, but I wanted to lay out definitions for both of these concepts as we begin to talk about humble leadership. So now I want to transition to talk a little bit about humility and humble leadership, and I'd like to begin by sharing a timeline. So uh, humility is seen as a timeless moral virtue or vice uh, seen in religious and philosophical traditions. By virtue, I am using a definition from Solomon where he described virtue as a pervasive trait of character that enables someone to fit into society. Morris describes humility, and I quote, as a personal orientation founded on the willingness to see the self accurately and a propensity to put oneself in perspective involving neither self-debasement nor overly positive self-regard. Humility as a construct to be examined within organizational literature is relatively new within the last 20 years. So Collins, you see on the timeline in 2001, began to articulate in his seminal book, Good to Great, why some companies make the leap and others don't, the qualities of CEOs who were able to move a company from good to great, and his articulation of humility, Collins described personal characteristics of CEOs who presented as humble, while Morris and others, they describe humility as a virtue. Well, Peter Sieg Peterson and Siegelman, these are positive psychologists, in their 2004 study of positive psychology, they focus 
focused on virtues and strengths as a way to measure humility, while other scholars also grappled with how to describe humility as a leadership style that can be enacted to produce outcomes organizationally. And we see that on the timeline in the work of Morris, Austin, Owens and Heckman, Nielsen and Marone. When we moved down to uh, 2013, there was a book published by Nielsen, Marone and Ferraro, the father of organizational development and this author of Humble Leadership is Dr. Ed Shine. Ed Shine is credited with creating the term of humble leadership. He is emeritus professor of the MIT Institute Sloan School of Management. He first articulated uh, the what of humble leadership in 20, 2018. Shine described the act of personizing relationships to develop trust and openness as central to humble leadership. And I'm going to explain what personizing means later. Dr. Shine's work attempted to add to the discourse about humility as a trait and a state by delineating ways of being and habits of mind to enact humble leadership in organizational settings. So this is his uh, most recent book, 2021, uh, they published Humble Inquiry. So Dr. Shine works with his son. Um, that's uh, his son whom he works with. So now on to uh, an initial definition of humility by Morris. Um, so a discussion of humility does require some examination of the religious traditions because humility is most frequently viewed as a moral virtue. Taoism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all describe humility in their sacred texts. And some texts, humility is seen as submission. While within Christianity, it is widely believed that humility enables people to see others as worthy of love and compassion. This is from Huizinga. Humility as a concept is rooted in philosophical and religious traditions, and humility as a trait is found to overlap with other well-established leadership styles, authentic leadership and servant leadership. I've been thinking about humble practices and how we engage and practice as librarians in the workplace with our colleagues and with our patron. At, with our patron population. And as I've been thinking about this topic, I've been thinking about an acting humility, humility in the workplace and having a humble practice. I realized that thinking about this topic in more concrete concrete terms might be relevant for us as practitioners. So reading the work of Tawana Hodge, Elias Scholar, and other scholars in the helping professions like nursing and social work have helped me to think about humble, humble leadership as a type of humble practice that one can be intentional about developing and engaging with. So I want to share with you um, these characteristics of humble leaders that I found within the literature. There's some discourse about the development of a theory of humble leadership. However, unlike some of the other leadership theories described in the seminal Nordhaus textbook, where a theory exists that describes a leadership approach, humble leadership as a theory is emergent. Therefore, key characteristics of humble leadership are emergent as well. So Nielsen et al. in 2018 described strong relational orientation as a key characteristic of humble leadership. And these are other characteristics, which I won't read all of these to you, but these are other characteristics of humble leaders that I found in the literature. I just want to give you a moment to digest some of those. So these, there's these characteristics of humble leaders, but then there's personal humility. And per Collins in 2001, I mentioned earlier, his seminal book, Good to Great, he delineated four features of a humble leader. Collins described these features of having the ability to move a company from good to great as number one, demonstrating a compelling modesty and shunning public public adulation and never being boastful. Number two, acts with quiet, calm determination, relies principally on inspired standards, not inspiring charisma to motivate folks. And number three, 
channels ambition into the company, not the self, sets up successors for even greater success in the next generation. And number four, looks out the window, not in the mirror to apportion credit for the success of the company to other people. So external factors and good luck. So looking out the window rather than looking at the self. And if you haven't read Good to Great, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a wonderful book. So those are the four features of personal humility that Collins found. But then there's uh, just a little bit of what I am thinking of as theorized humility from Nielsen and Marone. And they describe these three characteristics of a humble leader. So this idea that it's not that you're not um and not that you're not confident, but it's that you're willing to see yourself accurately. So you see yourself as a leader with your faults as well as with your strengths. So you're not um, having a false sense of humility and downplaying your strengths. Rather, you see yourself accurately. Also having an appreciation of others. So having the ability to appreciate one's staff, how the work that folks are doing, and also the ability to appreciate those whom you serve when we think about libraries. And then teachability, having the ability to be a lifelong learner. I'm going to share with you just a little while in a little bit my pillars of cultural humility and how this uh, fits together. So I think this, this core that Nelson and Marone uh, share with us. I think it represents this interpersonal and intrapersonal, interpersonal and intrapersonal aspects of humility. So how we relate with one, how we relate with one another in our workplaces. I think this is a really important aspect of that. So there's some other like down in the dirt <laughs> aspects of uh, cultural humility that Shine really outlined. So was, these are things that I thought were really um, helpful and concrete. So having the ability to uh, run effective meetings, it's valuing others' time. He describes that as a hum as having being a humble leader, building a strong teams. He also has this concept of personization or professional intimacy. And I think it's really important to define this for you. He defines personization as doing something informal together away from work, taking a walk or having a meal. He discusses uh, the importance of working with direct reports and close collaborators and focusing on building the relationships to establish openness and trust and having professional intimacy. So they just shine and shine. In 2018, they described levels of relationships with a key relationship being this level two type of relationship. So this level two type of relationship is not transactional. It's characterized by personization or this professional intimacy, as I've just defined. So again, they describe it as getting to know your colleagues and workmates beyond transactional relationships. So this is really focusing in libraries. I'm thinking about the relationships that we have with one another, with our colleagues. So getting to know our work colleagues and workmates beyond transactional relationships, the humble leader, as described by Shine and Shine, will get shine and shine, will get to know others at the more personal level in order to develop a higher level of openness and trust. This implies a person who is open, in other words, has some willingness to be vulnerable, as well as an ability to create a trusting atmosphere. A humble leader is acting with openness and makes a choice to add an emphasis, not only on metrics, but on what happened and when it happened. So other characteristics of humble leaderships, humble of a humble leader includes um, being creating these different types of teams and highly structured hierarchies. So the way that um, I have been thinking about libraries is that libraries are often very hierarchical. And humble leadership pushes against that and suggests that you can create these level two teams, even in highly structured settings. So this personalization that creates intimacy and trust by focusing on relationships and establishing trust 
beyond the workplace. So a humble leader can work anywhere in the organization, but is vulnerable to senior executives of support. And the es essence of humble leadership is maintaining an acute focus on interpersonal group dynamics. So I want to transition here to connect humble leadership to my thinking about cultural humility and uh, as a way to view humble leadership as a practice within these three pillars of this framework that I developed. So thinking about um, talent at a uh, level two relationship. So you're not just looking at what folks are doing, you're developing these relationships, you're talking with people, you're going for walks with people, you're connecting with people. So I've developed this framework of these three pillars of what I think of as cultural humility. And so uh, the first pillar is the idea of making this commitment to learning. Um, and it refers to a person having this habit of mind or way of being that you're a lifelong learner who deliberately and bravely establishes a practice of rigorous self-reflection and critique. So you're learning, but you're also practicing this self-reflection and critique. And I think that's a part of what Marone said earlier, being aware of yourself. And then pillar two is acting to remove power imbalances by having a willingness to acknowledge and dismantle power differentials based on authority or position. So in the library context, I think about this in terms of if one has a supervisory role and they can act in that supervisory role to eliminate power imbalances. I also think it up about it in terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, how we might be able to eliminate power imbalances with our peers. So really acting to remove those power imbalances. And even when I think about how we serve our patrons, there's also ways that we can act to remove power imbalances. So we can act to remove power imbalances by haptics, by how we position ourselves, um, prosthetics, for example. So we can commit, the last uh, pillar is uh, pillar three, which is commit to connect. And it refers to making a commitment to connect with the community one serves or supports. So um, this is the idea that we commit to the, the community that we're supporting and that we act in ways to um, move beyond transactional relationships with that community. So cultural humility challenges us to practice self-reflection through a process of committing to learning. And I want to um, think about this, um, this, this idea of this bridge called leadership. And this is from the work of Dr. Sonia Horsford, who described the concept of bridge leadership for educators in the 21st century. And I'm thinking about humble leadership as a potential bridge for others. Um, so you can act to remove power imbalances to support others. And also humble leadership does something that Robinette suggests in their 1997 article that includes the acknowledgement of hierarchical features of leadership. So I'm connecting this idea of humble leadership to this framework of cultural humility and situating humble leadership as a humble practice within this framework of cultural humility. So, to do that, let's take a look at the levels of relationship that Shine describes. So he describes these um, three levels, uh, four levels of relationships. So I want to share with you. So the, the first level is in the upper left quadrant. It's the level one minus relationship. So these are total and personal domination and coercive relationships in the workplace. And level 
one relationships would be these transactional role and rule-based supervisor relationships. And he describes this in his work as these are the types of relationships that we see a lot in the helping professions where it's rule-based supervision. Um, so at the circulation desk, you have the team leader who's the supervisor. You have the folks who are working at the circ desk. So there's like, they are doing the transaction. It's rule-based supervision. So level two uh, relationships, these are personal, cooperative, trusting relationships as in friendships, and they occur in effective teams. So. I really like the way Shine describes um, this level two relationship because he's not suggesting, he's not suggesting that people at work have to be your best buds. <laughs> he's not suggesting that, but he's suggesting that we really try to develop these personal, cooperative, trusting relationships and friendships. And I think I'm thinking about the work of liaison librarians, for example. Liaison librarians often work in teams and they have to be highly collaborative and cooperative but there may be some sticking points with developing trust, right? Depending on the culture and the environment of the institution where folks are laboring. So this level level three relationship that uh, Shine describes is emotionally intimate and it's a total um, mutual commitment. So I want to like give you a little bit more of the definitions of these relationships, how he describes them. And rather than um, me reading them to you, I'm going to give you a moment to read them. And I've highlighted the, the key words in each one of these relationships that I, I'd like you to take a look at. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit more. I'm going to give you a moment to read. So if we just focus in on uh, the, the level two relationships, you can, again, see, as I've discussed uh, just a bit earlier, that um, these, these level two relationships, it's the, it's the really getting to know one another at a more personal level. And some people may be uncomfortable <laughs> with that. But I think what's happened during the pandemic is that some of the walls may have been broken down and folks are getting to know one another at a more personal level. This may or may not be true in all libraries across the nation, but I think it certainly happened in uh, some of the libraries that I've been working in over during the, the course of the pandemic and relationships I've had with others that I've seen um, some getting to know one another at a more personal level. So, uh, when we think about uh, moving on to this quadrant of leadership, so these quadrants of leadership. So we have relational uh, at the top of the quadrant and then humble leadership in the right quadrant. So we have relational and personal. So humble leadership fits within that quadrant. And this transactional and heroic leadership this. So heroic leaders are those leaders who are focused on I, the, so they're focused on I and focused on the transactions, whereas the humble leadership is focused on the not deeply personal, but on the personal and real, the personized personization and relational aspect of relationships. So I want to share with you now like getting to a humble leadership practice so to get to this practice Dr. Shine has some things that he recommends he recommends doing focused reading and reflecting and he calls this desk work because he recommends that you do this at your workplace um, so at the end of this talk I uh, uh, I have a short list of books that he recommends reading for reflecting on humble leadership. And the desk work, he 
views it as drawing a relational map around yourself with the names and titles of the people who are connected to you in the sense of expecting something from you. So if you're like me, a liaison librarian who supports three schools, I used to use a tool called Coggle. Before I even knew about relational (laughs) mapping, I used a tool called Coggle to help me map all of the key players in all of my schools, because these will be all folks who would be expecting things from me. So Dr. Dr. Shine calls these folks your role senders. He provides a map, and I'm going to share this map with you. And then he also talks about having some enhancement of your behavioral skills. So to be curious about people, to have an interest in folks. So this is the uh, desk work map that he recommends that one use to uh, draw a relationship, draw themselves in the center, and then all of the other role senders who you're relating to. So in this uh, example from the book, Shine and Shine, he has included here your friends and your family as well, but you can do this map in any way that works well for you. So now let's think about like the value and significance of uh, cultural, of, of humble leadership as a humble practice. So Throughout the literature, these are some of the uh, aspects of value and significance I found that um, humility as as a competitive advantage, um, that having that one person can play a small role in a vast universe, uh, that flatter organizations encourage bottom up communication um, and having collaborative behaviors that include information sharing and joint decision making. I I don't know if people are like me. I don't like it when folks make decisions and then just want me to just go along with the decision. It's nice to be included in the decision making. So having collaborative behaviors. These are characteristics of uh, humble leadership, the value and significance of it in the workplace. Having an interdependence with one another. And these are some of the actual um, companies that uh, in, that were listed in not just uh, the not just in shine and shines work but this these are companies that I found also in uh, Jim Collins's work and I want to make a note that um, in June of this year, Um, Ikea, they had some problems with their Juneteenth uh, menu, and there's been some changes. For example, Herb Keller is no longer the president at Southwest Airlines, but these are companies that uh, value humility. So humble leaders have to operate on different levels to form these kind of level two connections. They have to move beyond self-related outcomes to positive outcomes for their followers, teams, and organizations that result from leader humility. So these outcomes could include employee engagement, retention and psychological engagement, team integration and performance, and firm performance, the performance of the the organization overall, and innovation in the organization. So now, I would like to share with you uh, another Minty poll and ask you, how does this concept of humble leadership challenge any ideas you might have about hierarchical levels of leadership within libraries or research environments? So I'm going to stop share here and I'm going to share the Minty poll to see what the audience says. Uh, explodes hierarchy. (laughs) Okay. Difficult. Yeah. Boundaries, right. Boundaries are important. A dream. (laughs) Inclusive. Hard. Okay. 
antisocial workers <laughs> need to be vulnerable, trust and authenticity. Okay. Lots of comments. Difficult is difficult is really centered here. <laughs> Japanese office. Oh, that's an interesting comment. Okay. Just a few more coming in. Okay. I think our word cloud has difficult as the the biggest thing, value, a needed change. Leaders must be human. Okay. So this really challenges some of our ideas about hierarchical levels of leadership in libraries. Hmm. I used to live and work in Japan too. <laughs> so this is it's interesting. Okay. So I'm going to escape and share my slides. Again, thank you all for participating in this poll. Let me share um, here. And I'm going to go back to my slides. Okay. So um, how does so how does this intersect with other levels, other leadership styles? So uh, humble humble leadership or humility uh, it overlaps in all three of these leadership styles, the concept of humility does. And I have here, so on the upper left quadrant, authentic leadership. Uh, authentic leadership is described as uh, the leader possesses integrity. They have a profound sense of self-awareness that includes their strengths, knowledge, and morals. They're concerned about followers with less power and greater need for help. Value self, they value self-expression. And the upper uh, right quadrant, I have uh, servant leadership. And this uh, describes, uh, servant leadership describes is described as a leader who converts followers into leaders, prioritizes the needs of followers, is concerned about followers with uh, less power and a greater need for help. So you can see like both of those types of leadership, at least one element of them fits within my frame, my pillars, those pillars of cultural humility. And then the humble leadership Describes appreciation for others, a focus on a transcendent self view that something greater than the self exists. There's an openness to feedback and growth. And then humility connects all three of those. But then we ask, like, how do you really measure humble leadership, right? So in this world of academia, we often want to measure things. So there are there are out there, uh, the DISC is the, um, is one of the um, leadership uh, tools that has a humble leadership that measures humble leadership within the eight dimensions of leadership. There's some other uh, self-report measures. There's the implicit association tests. Uh, these are ways that uh, humble leadership is, is measured. So in the self-report with the DISC, the dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness, you see like humble, they have this one uh, slice of their pie that measures humble leadership. And they describe these, in the DISC uh, assessment, they describe strengths of a humble leader and uh, they describe the strengths of a humble leader as they're able to head off potential problems with careful planning. They provide others with the tools necessary to do they, their work. They're able to create the stable environments. They maintain their composure under pressure, even under stress. They're conscientious. They model a steady work ethic. They expect themselves and others to deliver accurate outcomes. Uh, so these are the ways that DISC measures uh, humble leadership. But there's some limitations, right? So um, as we saw in our Minty poll, within organizations, there might be some resistance from bureaucratic and hierarchical organizations that rely on transactional relationships, even though the even though humble leadership did not, even though um, 
shine and shine. They don't focus on humble, on, on humble leadership in libraries. Libraries are highly transactional, focused, hierarchical organizations. There might be resistance to developing the soft skills required to personalize and develop level two relationships. The call for vulnerability and developing relationships with workmates that are not transactional might be uncomfortable for some leaders. Within the COVID-19 environment, I mentioned this before, environments and organizations have been forced to move into spheres of vulnerability within a generation they've not probably seen likely for, for many, many years. So within this new environment, there still exists limitations. So there may be, as, as was noted in the Minty poll, resistance to change. A tension between new styles of leadership and ways that require working with vulnerability. Developing soft skills that create openness and trust and grappling with the question of can humility can be can humility be taught? So there's some criticisms also. Um, there's some difficulty with measuring humbleness, as noted by Davis. And how do you grow in hum humility in persons? Nelson and Marone pose that question. Um, Shine and shine make it clear that the outcomes to an organization committed to humble leadership practices is more openness and trust. There is criticism, though, with a measurement in neoliberal environments where return on investment or showing concrete outcomes is a mandate, there is difficulty with measuring humility. In addition to kowtowing to neoliberal mandates, Nielsen and Marone ask, how do you grow humility in people? <laughs> as an emergent leadership style, humble leadership is still viewed as a trait-like characteristic. So how do folks who are not humble <laughs> develop humility? Lastly, if humble leadership is seen more as a trait or state-like characteristic, there are two developed leadership styles already with well-developed theoretical frameworks that already include humility as a trait or state, and those are servant leadership and humble leadership. So my thinking is, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Uh, the future of humble leadership is to look at the context over content, to think about distributed power, think about having a dynamic, organ dynamic organizational design. These are some futures of uh, humble leadership. So I want to give you an opportunity now to uh, pause and uh, recall your work history and uh, think about any projects that went well. This is from Shine and Shine uh, uh, and relationships that you have with colleagues or managers or direct reports. Do you see any correlation between jobs that went well in these and strong level two relationships with work colleagues? So those relationships where you got to know one another a little bit more beyond the workplace. And that's my question to you all. I'll let folks respond in the chat. Yeah, right. Those, right. Those level two relationships. Right. So making, yep. This is, this is great. I'm saying, yeah. Wow. This is good. Wow. This is great. Wow. Thank you, Kristen. So the projects that didn't go well, the distrust and resentments, right? So having the trust and the openness. Yes. Wow, the sense of belonging. 
made the company much worth worthwhile to be at. Thank you, Caitlin. Oh, wow. April is <laughs> hashtag goals for this. Okay. Ted, commitment to connect was easier. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. This is really at level two relation, level two relation, even develop within project. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, co collaboration and having the level two relationships, that's important. Okay. So we have, I want to thank you. We have time for a Q&A. I want to just share with you these uh, two books by Shine and Shine um, and suggest uh, you read them in Nordhaus. Even though it's a textbook, it's a really good book. <laughs> And these are all of uh, some, a few selected books by Shine that he recommends also. Okay. All right. Man, thank you so much. This was so insightful. I really um, appreciate all of what you've shared and appreciate you and also the relationship or not relationship, the relational mapping that exercise. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to start in my mind, at least, because mm -hmm. then you see the different roles and maybe the areas where you can make more traction or need to make traction, we'll say. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciated that, that mapping and uh, the desk work, right? As, mm -hmm. as Shine calls it. Shine calls it desk work. Yeah. Um, let's go to the chat. Are there questions? Uh <laughs> There was so much rich content here. I was taking, uh, I have like two pages here of just notes and like, I need to go back and dive deeper into these topics as I'm sure others do too. Oh, thank you. Um, I know, I, hopefully you can see the chat. There's a lot of great yeah. comments coming in. Let me just, I'm gonna scroll all the way up, make sure we didn't miss any questions from the beginning. Um, a lot of thank yous and resonating with you and uh, time, very timely, uh, given where some individuals are in their workplaces. Um, there was a question about the references will be shared. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we post the recording, however, on the iSchool website, um, we do post the link and we can share uh, your slides there as a PDF if you're um, fine with sharing the slides there. Yeah, I'm fine with sharing them. And then everyone can have access to the references. Okay. Thank you. And here there are a, another question that came in. Um, do you have suggestions on what we can uh, look for when hiring leaders such mm -hmm. as deans, associate, your deans, et cetera, either as participants and hiring committee members? Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I don't shine, shine and shine. Shine really talks about how um, he gave a really great example of, I don't know that you, you see this before you hire the person, but when <laughs> he gave a great example of hiring uh, a leader for a Virginia health system and how that uh, leader wanted to take everyone over to Japan to learn the certain way that they were doing this particular system. And people were really balking at that. Like, why do we have to do that? So it's, it's really difficult to know when you hire someone. Uh, it seems like you have to see them in action because you don't know. Sometimes the person you interview is not the person who shows up for the job. So it's really difficult, I think, <laughs> to select for a humble leader unless you're looking at their past work. So this person who was hired to take over this Virginia health system, he took all the folks to Japan. They were very upset that they even had to go. But then once they got there and they were learning this whole new process and they came back and they were like, oh, this was a really great idea. So he was really working on these level two relationships, building this like openness and trust. But he had to get the job first to do that. So I wish I had a better suggestion, but 
Um, I'm wondering if you could utilize whether it's a, a behavioral mm. question, right? That maybe then draws out some of these um, traits, if it's, you know, worded properly, we'll say, but that's the difficult part, right? Mm -hmm. The question should be, um, and I think we, we all hopefully support one another in trying to create those questions that, of course, to fill the position, but that you can really see what that behavioral aspect, if it can come out. And like you said, that's a hard one, but a Mm -hmm. great question. It's a great question. Uh, here's another question. Is there a way to nudge higher ups or decision makers to consider this model? Um, probably hard statistics or what would you recommend? Maybe hard statistics. If you were, for example, depending on what type of library you're in, if you could look at how effective the teams are, like how effective are the projects, you could make a case then for this model of humble leadership, if you have people working with these level two relationships and they're very collaborative and they're effective with their output, the outcomes, because Shine makes that point that the humble organization, humble leaders will have these high, this output, the outcomes from their folks. So I think you can make a case with the output of people. What do you think? I think so. And it looks like others agree in the chat, yeah. a lot of dialogue. Um, that might be a good starting point. We know, mm-hmm. um, you know, administrators, higher ups like hard data. So yeah. if you can justify it. Or even if there's a case study, I think mm-hmm. case studies go a long way too, especially successful case studies. Oh, that's a really good point. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, what do you suggest for people who supervise, but not quite management in trying to change views of leadership? Uh, working in a place that is trying to change and be innovative, but also still really values the hierarchy and heroic leadership. Mm. So if you don't quite supervise and you're not quite management, maybe you lead by example, like, you know how they say managing up? I think leading by example. So how are you as a person who generates openness, trust, and this personization of relationships? How are you with your role senders? Because that could be an example. I think that might be one way. I think that's a great um, suggestion. There might be other ways. Uh, What do others think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, back to the question earlier about um, with the interviewing, um, also references. So references and checking references, the references may, you know, offer some response that might allude to uh, back to this concept of humble leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then using your network. Uh, see if you can get feedback from places they've worked before, what kinds of leadership style they've demonstrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, there's a couple more questions here, and I know we have about five minutes, so I want to mm-hmm. see if we can get to these ones. Okay. Uh, let's see. We all want to go to Japan. Some <laughs> conversation about going to Japan. <laughs> Japan is great. I, I recommend going. <laughs> um, here's another question. Uh, how do you practice humble leadership with direct reports who are underperforming? Mm-hmm. The balance between encouraging them to improve versus letting them know that a change might be what will work best for both parties. Mm. This reminds me of the story in Shine and Shine (laughs) where uh, he uh, was talking about a higher up on a Navy vessel. And there was a a person on the vessel who had made a really bad error. And normally the higher up wouldn't even talk to this person. It would be an intermediary. But this person had to go to the higher up. So the 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 higher up didn't chastise the person, but just laid out for them. So I think like being honest and lay out for that underperforming person, like this is the thing that's happened. These these are the 
ways that we can fix it. And if it can't be fixed, then people do need the opportunity to leave and find a new opportunity. In this case, it worked out well in the Shine and Shine book because the lower person was really afraid that this admiral, I can't remember the um, rank of the person, but he was really afraid that this person had called him in, but then he was, everything worked out okay. But is that a, is that a, does that answer your question? I don't know who that is. If it doesn't answer your question, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll, we'll circle back. Yeah. Um, there was a, a follow-up here and I think, and we might need more context, but the question was, do you have statistics from other organizations? So I think that might go with the earlier question related to um, the hard data mm -hmm. and showing that to decision makers, but clarify me if I'm wrong. Um, that was uh, Susan, clarify me if I'm wrong. Um, there's another comment too. Uh, what do you do when you've got an under, okay. So what do you do when you've got an underperforming supervisor who has explicitly said, and this is a real quote, mm -hmm. I don't reflect and I can't promise to be reflective in the future when asked about how they work to grow as a leader. Mm. Done lots of managing up organizational and social strategies, communication strategies. Um, yeah. Do you do I cut my losses? Yeah, that sounds like a hard situation. So, yeah, you have to think about your position. Can you find another position if that's not working for you? You know, sometimes we have to leave. And I, good to great. If I know I mentioned that people should, that was, that's such a great book because I was thinking about it. I wasn't, I hadn't read Shine and Shine yet before I read Good to Great. And then I read Shine and Shine. And I went back to Good to Great. And I was like, oh, this is, he's really, he's really talking about these humble leaders, like these people who really took these companies from good to great. And so people like Lee Iacocca, who was like, I, 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 like Chrysler, <laughs> Chrysler did not stay great. It got sold off to another company because he just, he couldn't, re he could not reflect on anything other than himself. And a follow-up, I think, with that is um, and a suggestion, if they can't reflect, maybe they can project. So can they share their growth plan? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's too more of engaging them in the practice. So mm -hmm. giving them that ownership as well. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for that. Uh, I know we have two minutes. I don't see any other questions. I hopefully did not miss any one. Um, I want to give the floor back to Zan for a, a final, if she has any, you know, final comments for us or words of wisdom we can take <laughs> away or one last takeaway and then we'll, we'll close it out. Um, I'm thinking about uh, cultural humility and how it relates to libraries and developing some kind of model and framework as I think about these topics. So thank you all for having me and um, please reach out if you have better ways I can think about this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Future collaborations, right? Yeah. In the making. <laughs> um, we really appreciate you and for being a part of, uh, of sharing your time today, your expertise, and to thank all of the attendees um, for taking time out of your day to listen in and learn and continue to grow. So thank you again, Zan. Thank and you. I hope everyone has a, a great, oh, can we put your email in the chat? Oh yes, I will put my email in the chat. As we leave, somebody asked. There it is. <laughs> and if you have a Twitter handle. Oh. You know, all the, all the ways we can connect with you. <laughs> and it'll be on the slides and the recording, of course. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.